thank you both so much. It's a total pleasure to have you here to talk about disruption. You're both incredibly accomplished. Those are amazing bios. So we can't wait to hear your uh, perspectives on these issues. So um, maybe to begin with, Catherine, would you mind telling us a bit more about the 3A Institute and how it was born? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I also acknowledge that I'm here on the Ngunnawal lands. Pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, the 3A Institute is the first innovation institute at the Australian National University, and it's part of a program called Reimagine in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, and the idea there is to think about what engineering is going to be in the 21st century. Now, the 3A Institute itself is led by distinguished professor uh, Genevieve Bell. Uh, she's a very well-renowned uh, cultural anthropologist and also vice president at Intel. And she came back to Australia um, to be able to think more broadly about what we need in the future and how we can develop a new branch of engineering that can help us take artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence powered cyber physical systems safely, responsibly and sustainably to scale. And one of the things that we're doing is rather than research about the future, we decided that we were going to teach this new discipline into existence. And so a couple of years ago, we set up a new uh, master's program, uh, a very interdisciplinary program with a whole cohort of amazing individuals uh, to help us build this branch of engineering together. Uh, and so we have a whole range of, of research tasks that we also bring into the education programs and a lot of outreach uh, exhibitions and, and other things that we do to bridge you know, the arts, the sciences, the policy, uh, and even how we can think about decommissioning some of these systems in the future. Great. That sounds right up our alley here at MOD, especially that intersection of art and science. And I love what you said about um, teaching a discipline into existence. That is a really interesting way of looking at it. Um, so Tom, we might pass over to you for a second. So can you tell us a bit more about what it was like being part of the first cohort at 3AI? Um, it was an exhilarating experience. Uh, and as, as Catherine was saying, uh, while, while the teachers and the research staff were teaching it into existence, we were trying to kind of learn it into existence. <laughs> um, so it was, uh, as, as, you know, as, as we were told from the start, it was going to be very agile, very iterative. We were um, experimenting with a lot of different things. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, no single week was the same. Um, we got exposed to uh, many different things, many different uh, amazing uh, uh, teachers and guests, experts. Um, and, and as you were saying, Ashton, I mean, uh, one week we could be having, you know, a data and analysis uh, masterclass from our vice chancellor, who's a Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist. Next week we could be learning about, um, you know, uh, how filmmakers use VR to influence policy at an international level. Um, Emmy award winning uh, uh, filmmakers. So. Um, I loved it because it was just so interdisciplinary and switching between, uh, you know, quote, technical um, and artistic uh, uh, endeavours and disciplines. So, yeah, um, it was great. That sounds brilliant. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And maybe sort of to follow on from that, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about your area of interest and how your involvement with 3AI informed your approaches in, in that area? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, but my background is in uh, the law and the economics. Um, that's my training um, and specifically the intersection of it. So how do you apply economic tools to analyze uh, the law, what it is and what it should be? Um, so I've always been an interdisciplinarian and I always valued that that's, um, a, you know, a lot of the truth and the magic happens when you bang those things together. Um, but and on the flip side too, you, you also get a lot of blind spots if you don't bang those things together. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so when I, you know, I was working um, in the uh, Victorian public service when I came across this and I had seen in my time, uh, you know, disruptions, technological disruptions coming, coming wave after wave and, and they've always been a little bit frustrated about, uh, you know, can we do this better? Um, and so when, yeah, when I saw this course, 
um, I said, oh, wow, this is like, this is, this is what we need. Um, we need to have these conversations um, and think more proactively and in, in the long, long term. Uh, rather than just you know um, having knee-jerk reactions whenever the, you know the next Uber or whatever else comes you know comes our way, um, so th yeah, that's how I got got involved and applied, and lucky enough to uh, be one of the the first um, sixteen guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine, um, what's been the most challenging aspect of creating new ways of thinking at, at Three AI? Like like you you describe it as kind of teaching it into existence. What's been those challenges along the way? Yeah, I think in some ways you, you mentioned in the bio, I think it's the, the, class of, the clash of disciplinary cultures and different people's expertise. I think it's also one of the most exciting parts of the endeavour is that all of the, the staff at the Institute come from very different backgrounds, um, whether that be disciplinary culturally. Uh, and so working with a huge range of people who have never had to work with similar kinds of people before is amazing. And then you have 16 students who range in age from sort of 25 to, to 60 who come from the arts, engineering, theatre, um, computer science, nuclear physics, you know, all these really, really diverse um, places. And then to put those people together and to see how they're able to communicate, how to develop knowledge together, mm -hmm. I think that's both the most challenging and the most exhilarating part of this program. Um, and we just keep wanting to add sort of more and more difference, but difference in, in a way that each one of those people and part of that cohort design is that they also have some similarities. They're people who are mission driven, who want to make a difference in the world. They're people who value diversity. Um, they're people who do take care with their communication to be able to talk to one another and to listen really effectively. So there are some similarities in our people, but also extreme diversity. And it's the extreme diversity that that's the most challenging and exciting part. Yeah, that's interesting to hear that. Yeah, the, 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 mo the biggest challenge is also the most interesting area. Um, and perhaps, uh, Tom, uh, we've just got a little bit of a, an audience question that's come through. Um, and I might ask you, Tom, in regards to the adoption of machine learning in designing or controlling how our systems operate, what concerns or considerations are there in regards to unexpected or undesired outcomes? Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, well, this is a big one. <laughs> um, I guess uh, I kept well, well. One one aspect of of uh, machine machine learning that we learned about is you know the uh, how data driven it is, and and that I guess the old adage of uh, you know rubbish in rubbish out that still applies in the sense of you know, how do you train. Um, uh, 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 an AI to do something, and I don't. I think one key challenge that we are only starting to realize, or that it's become more mainstream, um, is is that um, uh, that just just like humans, the, the 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 data has human hands all over it, and and the biases that um, of the people who are collecting the data, processing the data, you know, filtering the data, that all affects what goes into training an AI. And um, so uh, I think a, a key challenge is, is just realizing that there are there are humans all along the chain from from the very beginning to the you know to the output. And and part of what we've been learning is how to de deconstruct the AI and to, to see where all those potential uh, uh, flaws, biases can creep in. And there are just you know, a myriad of examples of what you know, uh, uh, sort of bad outcomes or unintended consequences have uh, uh, occurred. Um, Robo debt. I don't know. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just drop that in there. Um, That's a strong example. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there are heaps. Um, no uh, facial recognition or you no know, image uh, recognition. Um, there's lots of uh, yeah, lot of gaps that and people are just stumbling along and um, and realizing that we can't just because it comes out of a computer, it doesn't mean it's sort of objective. Absolutely, that's such a good point you made about the many different human hands and biases that go along and that often when we see data we go oh but it's it's data yeah, from it's data yeah it, it must be true whereas mm. actually it's humans that have programmed that data mm. 
Mm. Um, along those lines, we have another audience question. Um, maybe you could answer this one, Catherine, which is, are there any areas you believe AI or machine learning is not appropriate or should not be utilised? I think this is, it's one of the biggest questions that we can ask. I do think that in many cases, it's a very context and culturally dependent question. And it's one that I think particularly in any, well, in any, any country and governance system, it requires people to decide whether that is okay or not. Mm -hmm. So if you think about, let's take a really, a really challenging one, you know, a, a drone that can kill something, should that be autonomous? Um, most people would say absolutely not. Um, you know, we, we don't want that. You can have a look in some of the UN discussions for people who would say the trauma that comes from someone behind, you know, having to do that in an aircraft is really challenging. But then you can also think back to Australia. Would we, for example, want something that could get rid of invasive species? Is that something as if the recognition was good enough? we could do and you may have people debating for that you might have environmentalists debating for that mm -hmm. um, but these are questions that I think there is we have to ask them and we have to be really careful about um, about the context we're asking them in so one person's yes to that question maybe another person's no and I think we have to be cognizant of that and you're right, it's so important to ask the difficult questions rather than just go oh it's too hard we'll just see what happens <laughs> And we can, we can go into a context and we can work with people. And I think, again, this is the really exciting part about all these technologies. And as Tom talked about, with the hands that are there, there are also the voices that are there. And so the question is, how do we curate spaces where different people's voices can come together and we can decide collectively and reasonably um, with all the information that we have, biased or not, um, how we want to move forward. And that's part of the exciting part of politics and governance processes. Absolutely. Um, so that leads in quite nicely actually to our next question, which is um, for you again, Catherine. So what do you hope that people will take away from the work you're doing at 3AI? I hope that people will start to think more about the future and that we do have the opportunity to intervene in these systems and to build them collectively. Mm -hmm. um, AI is not just going to happen to us. Um, cyber physical systems are not just going to happen to us. There are people all through those systems who are building them, who are making decisions. Mm. And so if we can help those people understand the importance of the, the different decisions that they're making to ask better questions, to implement ways of thinking through the, the decisions they're making, I think we can have a huge impact. And if I take the example of um, decommissioning and if we look at some of the previous disrupt, dif, disruptive technologies if you take I don't know the steam engine for example mm -hmm. the pollution that came out of having to to develop these huge transportation systems and other things and how you powered them was immense so can we think now about pollution from AI powered cyber physical systems the energy costs of doing one uh, search on a, on a search engine or for using a deep learning algorithm. They're extraordinarily energy hungry and we have to store that data somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so are there, you know, coming back to that other question, maybe we might decide that there are some fickle uses of AI where we're going to say, actually, no, we're going to outlaw that because it's just using too much energy. Um, and then how are we going to use and think about all the materials that are involved in creating those, those physical systems and do we have enough? And are there other kinds of more environmentally friendly materials that we could use to develop them? Mm, so interesting. The, yeah, this is spurring so many different questions. And now, Tom, I'm going to ask you a really big question <laughs> along those lines. What do you think the key question we should be asking going forward is? Or key questions? <laughs> I don't know what the question is, but the answer must be 42, right? <laughs> Absolutely correct. <laughs> um, that's that's almost an impossible question to answer because part of what we're learning and we're trying to instill into uh, practitioners of this new branch of engineering is the art and craft of question asking. Mm. The problem is that we don't ask enough questions. Um, and so, I mean, uh, we do have some starting questions. So for example, the three A's were based on three questions or sets of questions that started with A. 
which is to do with you know autonomy. So asking questions of you know a, a robot or some physical system, and what does autonomy mean? Uh, we got issues of uh, assurance, um, so safety um, that brings in things like regulation, um, and then we also have agency, which is kind of you know how how much decision making do we do we want to delegate to a machine mm-hmm. um, to act in our, uh, on our on, on our own behalf um, and then in the 12 months that I know uh, that I was doing my masters we added some extra questions about how do we interface with the machines um, uh, metrics and indicators of how do we measure success uh, do we get it right um and the other i which is a key one and maybe if i was going to pick one um and it links back to what catherine was saying about context is uh, intent what Mm -hmm. is the intent behind uh what we're building um and going back to drones you can use that you know that as a as a platform for doing a whole range of things um and some of them will have no good impacts good um it's a value judgment there already but you know positive or negative impacts on on society depending on your perspective but asking you know um so rather than just saying this is a you know good or bad technology we got to dig a bit deeper because it's how i guess how you use it it's like fire um could mm. keep you warm give you light but you could also burn the you know burn the place down so same same probably goes with uh, when you're asking questions of machines absolutely that was a great answer to a very broad question. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, we've had a couple audience questions come through as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, Catherine, maybe I'll hand this one to you. So, um, has 3AI considered any intersections between arts and cybernetic research? And what potential do you see in art, science, tech collaborations? Absolutely, is the answer. Um, <laughs> I think one of, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we have a, a whole range of people who are involved in our institute. And one of the areas of research is around how art and technology comes together. So we do have some ongoing research working with artists, looking at the, the cutting edge of how technology is used in um, in the arts, so for example, drones in ballet, um, how we have immersive technologies and understanding where those artists are at and some of the challenges and successes that they've had in bringing those things together. And in terms of the cybernetics, thinking about how society and the environment and the technologies come together, that that's kind of sort of part and parcel of how an artist would think about expression and where you need to be in the environment to appreciate it, Um, whether that interfacing with the technology will change someone's perception, um, will change their feeling. And so you can see the the interaction of all of those. And it's just one of the parts of of our research. And we have a whole range of other programs, some of them that have some arts links. So we do have some research ongoing in the Great Barrier Reef. And Tom mentioned one of the Emmy award-winning artists. And we had Lynette Walworth, who's worked on uh, coral reefs and barrier reef who came in for our master students last year but we have another ongoing project um, out there we have we do work with mining we do work um, in the financial sector and a whole lot of other places so the art and the science is really important and then we're interested in seeing how how those kinds of thinking the cybernetic thinking is also applied in other domains mm. yeah well, for sure what well about uh, um Kepik, catherine Kepik and the rur where robot the word robot came from indeed and so one of the one of the big programs we've got on which was slightly scuttled with uh, with our current situation uh, is that uh, our colleagues have been reworking capex play um, rur and stay tuned because at some stage there will be a reenactment of that um, as a as a a reading to think about how all of the questions that were posed in this really important play uh, are still so relevant. So we've added a few characters, uh, you know, including our our own director, some other people to talk to about the the current uh, Norbert Wiener, sort of the the father of cybernetics, Uh, but that will be coming out soon, so stay tuned. Very cool. Definitely keep our eyes peeled for that one. 
That sounds great. Another question that's come from the audience, and I think you can just throw this one backwards and forwards between you as you work it out. Uh, they are asking, what do our speakers think the relationship between humans and technology will look like in 100 years? <laughs> just a small question to end Different. the interview on. <laughs> do we even know what's happening next week? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's what's interesting, and if if we look over the over the past century, is that we have more and more technology closer to us as humans. We're using it in different ways. I imagine that there will be more and more sort of electronic based or AI based um, systems, and that they may be within us. So, I mean, I remember when I when I first saw a, a card that you needed to go into a, a your office and I said, there's no way I ever want anyone to know that I'm going into my office with a card. Uh, and I'm assuming that will be embedded in us. They will know who we are and we can just walk to places and that will be, it will feel normal because it's, it's all we've grown up with. Um, that's one direction it may take. We may decide not to go in that direction, but I think we will be closer to technology and it will probably be part of us more than it is already today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I would love to um, just keep unpacking this stuff with you all, but unfortunately we're almost at the end of our time slot. I feel like this could have been a much longer interview, um, but we might just ask a couple of quick questions to end. So Tom, what would you say to anyone considering studying at 3AI? Uh, do it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Come on board. Take a ride. Yeah. <laughs> really, that should be the yeah. tagline. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Catherine, if people are interested in finding out more, and I think a lot will be after hearing this interview, where would you suggest they look? So the first place is on our website, and we've just got a new website that's been launched in the last couple of weeks. So we're really, really excited about it. There's a heap of information there if you're interested in applying for our master's program. Um, entrance to our PhD program is also through the master's. Tom didn't get to say that he's staying with us. He couldn't get it, he couldn't go away, and so he's about to do a PhD. Uh, so there's information on our website about that. But if you have any questions, um, straight through. Uh, to the masters is probably the main one and then some of our research and everything else is there and then you can always check out youtube oh that's great well thank you so much catherine and tom we'll have to have you back at some point in the future and um before 100 years with it closer than that we'll have you back and uh and we can talk more about um these topics and and more we really appreciate you coming on this afternoon thanks so much thank you so much it's a pleasure thank, thank you, you everyone